Ruin, Mated to the Alien, written by Kate Rudolph and Star Huntress, narrated by Zachary Michael. Chapter 17 Rue couldn't stop himself from draping his arm across Lissa's shoulders as they walked down one of the pathways back to his ship. She turned in toward him, her arm going around his back to pull him close. Some might have called the expression on his face smug, but her scent was embedded in his skin and her lips were still swollen from their lovemaking. He would have gladly stayed with her in that room until the processor ran out of food and the life support system sputtered out. In the end, it was Liss who convinced him they couldn't live in that small room forever. And when he mentioned Loam, she'd practically jumped at the chance to meet him. Should I be jealous that you're so eager to meet another male so soon after we bonded? He teased, his fingers playing with the soft locks of her hair. They might have left the room, but he couldn't stop himself from touching her now that she was truly his. Liss laughed. <laughs> You've discovered my ruse, she confessed facetiously. I'm collecting a score of Detian mates, maybe more, so I have enough for one for every day of the month. A warning flash of heat pulsed through him, and he could feel a growl starting in the back of his throat at the thought of Liss claiming any other man. But he caged the impulse. Humans joked like this. They spoke things that were not true for the sake of humor. He'd encountered the trade in several species, and even among some of the more well-traveled Detians. He would not take her words as a threat to himself. Still, his eyes flashed red, and he scowled when he spotted an Oscavian male checking her out. She could joke all she wanted, but that did not give strange males the right to leer at her. You're going to be possessive, aren't you? She asked, her fingers tracing a thin line up and down the edge of his hip. Rue wanted to take her again, right there in the middle of the hall. He'd never get enough of her, never become tired. You're mine now, he said his voice rougher than intended. But when she shivered, he was vindicated. Do you think I'd ever let you go? Liss met his gaze, her strange human eyes bright, and said, I'm not running. They made it down the final hallway and to the door to the hangar where his ship sat awaiting maintenance. That would begin the following day, and neither Rue nor Liss would be able to access the ship until it was deemed safe by the engineers but they could gather any belongings up until it went into the repair dock. The hangar doors slid closed behind them, and the lights flicked on in rows. A handful of other ships sat in the huge hangar, awaiting their time slots. These were all small vehicles built for crews of half a dozen or fewer people, just like Rue's ship. Anything larger than that remained in a stationary dock outside the space station. There simply wasn't enough room for them to park inside. It seems kind of quiet, Liss observed. From what he could see, they were the only two people in the hangar. It was early morning according to station time, but this was a hangar. There was always crew hanging around their ships. I agree, he said. But there wasn't anything out of place, except for the silence. They moved forward cautiously by unspoken agreement. Liss's fingers brushed against his own before she grabbed his hand and held it tight. This was a human sign of affection, one he liked very much, even if it meant one of his hands could not grab for weapons. They walked slowly down the center aisle, keeping their ears open for any of the noises that should have been there, but Rue could only hear the sound of their breathing and his heart beating erratically, blood pumping in his ears. Something was wrong, and his instincts screamed at him to take Liss and run for safety, but there was no clear danger. The lights cut off plunging the room into pitch darkness. What? Liz started to say. Rue squeezed her hand, cutting her off. Quiet. They were no longer alone. It wasn't anything he heard, not at first, but the inside of his ear itched, and suddenly the air felt almost damp, despite the stringently regulated environmental conditions in the hangar. Rue crouched down, pulling Liz with him as he shuffled them behind a freestanding locker case near the ship. Nearly a minute went by as they crouched in silence with nothing but the darkness and a nagging feeling yelling at him that they were in danger. The longer they waited, the more he expected Liss to protest. 
He'd made it clear that they were safe on Onora Station. Why would she believe otherwise now? But Lis pulled her hand out of his grasp, and he could hear her repositioning herself so that she knelt on one knee. She wouldn't be able to stand as quickly, but it made her more stable, more ready to defend herself from attack. The quiet pop of a button being undone told him that she'd carried her blaster and had taken it in hand, ready for a fight. There was chatter near the entrance. It was too dark to see them, but his darkened vision made hearing easier. He didn't understand the words, but he recognized the shapes of those sounds enough to know it was Poland. When Lys stiffened beside him, he knew that she'd come to the same conclusion. She sucked in a deep breath and started moving her lips up and down, silently saying words he could not understand. When she began to repeat herself, he realized that she was silently counting, trying to keep herself calm. I can hear three of them out there. It was less than a whisper, the barest hint of air bursting from his lips. It's probably a crew of seven. That was how Poland and attack crews worked on their own planet, and he doubted they'd deviate from the training now. Though Poland's never pursued, so any data he had was next to useless. Lys echoed his thoughts. I thought they wouldn't follow us. If they had been more than a handspan apart, he wouldn't have been able to hear her. As it was, his ears strained. Guilt was a jagged iceberg in Rue's guts. They had no reason to follow Lys. She'd been on their planet by accident, and all of the destruction that she'd done had been because of him. If he hadn't completed his mission, they would have been left to roam freely out of Poland airspace. He glanced over at the amorphous shadow of his ship. One of the laser blasts must have tagged it with a tracker. That they hadn't blown them out of empty space told him that the Polans wanted him alive. And with each second that ticked by, the Polans got closer to discovering them. A surge of protectiveness roiled to life within him. They only want me, he said. I can get you out. It didn't matter if they took him, so long as she was safe. The movement of her head drew his gaze, and in the dim light, she was made of little more than the alluring curve of her nose and the sweep of hair on her brow. You stupid man, she said, voice full of something that sounded a lot like love. I didn't claim you just to give you up at the first sign of trouble. Rue's heart scarcely beat. She'd chosen him. He'd claimed her. They were one. And yet, he expected at any moment to wake and find this a soul-crushing dream, even with the enemy at their heels. You're the best thing that has ever happened to me. In the dark, he could feel her smile. You can kidnap me any time. She leaned in and kissed him, her hand a hot presence on the back of his neck. She pulled back, and Rue set fresh senses on the hangar. They were getting out of here, and then he was going to deliver on the promise of the kiss that she'd just given him. He'd like to see a hostile alien try to stop him. There were only two realistic ways out of the hangar. Through the door the Polans had come in through, and through the entrance to the mech bay across the room. Ships could enter through the airlock when docking from open space, but Rue didn't even consider some frantic ploy to get them out that way. It was too high up and they'd be dead in minutes if they tried. He tugged on Lys until her body was flush up next to his own. Mech bay door, he breathed. Don't fire until they start shooting. It was across a wide expanse of open garage, but if they kept it low and slow, they could make it. He only hoped that no Polans waited in ambush on the other side of the door. He grabbed a heavy wrench off the nearest tool bench and breathed deeply. Then they were moving crouched as low as possible and saying prayers to their gods and ancestors that nothing unseen tripped them up in the dark. A trill of voices behind him let him know that the Polans knew they were on the move. They trusted that the lack of light would hinder Rue and Lys at least as much as it did them. The Polans were wrong. He'd walked blindfolded through the boiling hells for his mate. What was one dark hangar? They cleared the ships and got into the open space before their salvation, and Rue began to hope that they could sneak out without violence, and then Lys tripped. She righted herself immediately, but the sound reverberated through the open air, and the Polans turned on them with a harsh cry. Run! he yelled, no longer caring for stealth. Speed was their only saving grace now. She sprinted ahead of him, and Rue followed a hair's breadth behind as blaster shots echoed around them. 
Liz made it to the door, but instead of trying to open it, she turned her back to the wall and began firing, covering the rest of his escape. He heard a cry and thought one of the Polans must have been hit. He made it to the door and threw it open with a yank. And in the split second between wakefulness and darkness, he spied the ambush he'd feared. He didn't even feel the blaster hit him before he fell to the ground, and the last thing he heard was Lissa's scream. Chapter 18 Rue! Liss rose from the darkness, his name on her lips. Black closed in on her, and it took her a moment to realize that the lights were out and she was still sitting in the hangar that she and Rue had tried to escape. She looked around, trying to make out the shape of her mate in the darkness, hoping that her unconsciousness had saved them rather than doomed him. But the hangar was empty. The sound of her breathing echoed in the barren room. They'd taken Rue and left her alone. No! She wanted to scream, but rage lodged in her throat, keeping her silent. They were supposed to be safe. They'd made it off Palai. She'd shot down the satellite. And in Rue's arms, Liss had finally started to believe that this could be a new beginning rather than some too short interlude in the massive pile of suck her life had become. Fuck that. She sucked in one ragged breath and then another, heart racing but the beat even. Adrenaline coursed through her veins. The Polans had Rue, but he was hers, and there was no way in hell they were going to keep him. Liz pushed herself up from the floor, her palms cool against the dark tiles beneath her fingers. Though she was alone, and the Polans and Rue were gone, she didn't think that she'd been out for long. The scent of danger and laser blasts still hung in the air. She could almost taste the sparks of electricity still floating around her. The door to the mech bay lay open next to her, and the room beyond it shone with pale light. Liss listened for a moment before charging in, but both her ears and eyes were in agreement. There was no one there. Where are you, Ruin? An awareness she didn't quite understand pulsed deep within her, a spark so fragile that Liss scarce breathed, afraid to blow it out. But that little nugget told her that Rue was alive. Maybe not well, but alive and within reach. All she had to do was find him. Determination powered the long steps Liz took out of the hangar and back to the hallways of Onora Station. At first, she didn't know where to go, but turning a corner, she realized that the marketplace where she'd met the two humans from Seoul Station was close. She didn't let herself doubt. Rue had been taken, and she was going to get him back, whatever that took. She'd steal a damn spaceship if she had to. But when she burst into the marketplace and sprinted to where Sung Mi and Bitna had been sitting, she found the space occupied by unfamiliar aliens. Liss eyed the bright pink women for a moment before turning away without a word. Liss Jinx? She heard her name and turned with a snarl to find Sung Mi standing near her, a foaming drink in her hand. Sung Mi nodded to the woman behind Liss, but said nothing to them. I need your help. Liss was breathing hard the words and demands clambering to get out. But Sung Mi seemed to understand that the matter was urgent. She handed her drink over to one of the pink aliens and placed a hand on Liss's shoulder. Let's go someplace more private. Every step took an eternity, but Liss knew Sung Mi was right. She didn't need anyone interfering in getting Rue hurt. Not today, not ever. There were too many people in the marketplace, and every time Liss brushed up against one, nails raked against her skin. Her nerve endings felt exposed, and they wouldn't settle down until she had Rue back. Bitna met them near a small alcove with a door that closed when Sung Mi swiped her station card to rent it out for a short time. Rue had mentioned that there were hundreds of these soundproof workstations across Onora, available to anyone who could spare the credits. The two Korean women sat opposite her and waited for Liz to speak. Do you remember how I asked you about Detyens the other day? She asked. She didn't want to plow into her demands, but that would only lead to more questions she didn't have time to answer. Neither of the women was stupid, and Bitna confirmed that they'd guessed why she'd been so interested. So you are enmeshed with a Detyan. I'm sorry, but I don't know of any way to lengthen his... That's not it, Liz cut in. My... Uh, Rue's been taken by a group of aliens called Polans. We escaped from their planet a few weeks ago, and they're not happy with him. I need your help to get him back. Sung Mi furrowed her brow. How long ago did this happen? 
Have you gone to station security? Or perhaps you could appeal to the representatives of the Galactic Council. We're just freighters. How could we help? Station security? Yeah, because cops never made problems ten times worse. He's still here. If he's not on the station, then he's still close enough to save. It hasn't even been an hour, I'm sure. I can feel him. She placed a hand on her heart where the certainty had lodged, a reminder and a hope. Then you need to go into station security, Bitna insisted. That's a waste of time. Liz smacked her hand against the table and curled her fingers against the sting. Sung Mi jerked, but Bitna remained completely still. Liss's heart was pounding too fast, and for a moment, it felt like all of the air had been sucked out of her lungs. She tried to breathe, but she couldn't open her windpipe. Her vision went hazy around the edges, stars dancing. And, as suddenly as it came on, the fit stopped. They knocked him out, she said with a certainty she couldn't possess. How can you know that? asked Sung Mi. She sounded skeptical, but there was a hint of belief in her dark eyes. He's my Denya. We're connected. She could feel the bond as real as if a string was tied between them. For a moment, Sung Mi and Bitna held themselves still. Then they shifted their eyes toward one another in a silent conversation that Lys couldn't hope to parse. After a moment, Bitna nodded. She set her eyes on Lys and said, We're in. The Korean women told Liz to meet them in an exit bay in 30 minutes to give them enough time to gather a few supplies and cancel a standing appointment. Liz almost ran directly to the meeting place, but at the last minute, she remembered the man she and Rue had planned to meet later in the day, Lom. If anyone on the station would want to rescue Rue nearly as much as she did, it would be his almost uncle. She found his shop exactly where Rue had said it would be. The man was reviewing something on a tablet. The light from the screen only made his teal skin even brighter. He didn't look like Rue, not really, but there was something in the marks she could see on the exposed skin of his arms that reminded her of Rue, and when he looked up at her, Lys saw the same red gaze she'd come to associate with her lover. Rue's in trouble, she said before Lom could even begin to greet her. He set down his tablet and stood, and even from a distance, she could tell he was near six and a half feet tall. So. You're his human. There was ice in his voice, and she didn't know if it was for her or for Rue. From Rue's description, she'd expected a kindly man ready to welcome her with open arms. Lom was not that. I'm his Denya, she said, and I'm trying to save his life. I need your help. What's he done now? She wanted to scream to disrupt his calm, but Lom didn't look easily ruffled. Poland's took him. They left me. He's on the ship or near it. I've got two humans to help, but you're his family. You know this station. Please. She could feel the tears threaten to fall at the corners of her eyes, but Liz held them back. She couldn't break down, not until Rue was safe. Panic didn't solve problems. Where do you need me? Still cold as ever, but not hesitant. She gave him the location of the ship and left him to make his decision. Rue didn't have time for her to wait. Bitna and Sung Mi were waiting for her near the exit bay. A few moments later, Lom joined them. He covered himself in combat gear, completely obscuring the markings on his arms with a bodysuit made of tough-looking synthetic leather. I've alerted a friend in security. A Poland ship is scheduled to leave the exit queue in ten minutes. It suddenly rescheduled its departure this morning. He nodded to the two other women, but didn't introduce himself. Did he give you their identifier? Sung Mi asked, having determined that Lom was friend, not foe. Lom held up an iridescent silver disc. I have many friends on the station. What is that? Lys asked, feeling ever more out of her depth. It's a teleport key, Bitna explained, an assessing look in her eye as she studied Lom. And those are highly guarded. Lom shrugged, not explaining further. It holds the signatures of all this morning's teleports, which means, he said before Lys could interrupt him, that we can get onto their ship and retrieve Rue, but we need cover. I've got a blaster, and Lys was suddenly very glad that she'd thought to go to him. It seemed he had the answers to questions she hadn't known to ask. We can cover you in our cruiser, Sungmi offered. 
It doesn't have much range and only one gun, but Bitten is a crack shot. Bitten just shrugged off the praise. Good. This was all good. Then let's go. What are we waiting for? asked Alice. Only then did Lom hesitate. We'll be vulnerable in the few seconds after the port, so whoever goes first will be at the most risk. The station teleporter only could handle one biological specimen at a time. Anything more caused splice risks. I will shoot anything that tries to keep me from rescuing my mate. If you're too chicken, then I'll happily go first. Liss let all of the resolve sink into her voice until her words were pure steel. Loam nodded once his expression finally softening into something besides ice. I think then you'll be good for Rue. The approval warmed some unknown corner of her gut that hadn't ever known a parent's love. But Liz didn't have time for that right now. She could try to unravel the mystery of Loam later when Rue was safe in her arms. Let's do this. Chapter 19 Rue woke up to the sound of sirens blaring. At first he thought the klaxons and blinking lights were coming from inside his head, souvenirs of the blaster shot that had knocked him out. He didn't know where he was, but there were bars and he was shackled to a wall, ropes threaded through a bar and a half a meter above his head. He felt like he'd been pulled behind a freight truck through the high desert of Binko 3 and his mind was filled with tufted cotton. If the blaster the damn Polans had used on him had been set any higher, he might not have woken up with a mind of any use to anyone. He rotated his neck, trying to shake his thoughts into some sort of order. The siren and the lights really weren't helping. Why wouldn't they shut up? No, he thought, trying to think through the fuzz. Why were they ringing in the first place? Those were emergency alarms, and they weren't from a Nora station. He only knew that, due to a near-fatal leak in the life support system that he'd run afoul of three years prior, sometimes he still heard those klaxons in his nightmares. What blared in his ears now sounded completely different. It was too high-pitched, with a rapid beat tempo that kept his heart racing. The siren made him want to run, but straining against his bonds wasn't going to do him any good. The fog began to clear as his heart raced, and Rue sucked in deep breaths to keep himself under control. If he wasn't on Anora Station, it meant that the Polans had placed him on one of their own vessels. Even now, they could be speeding back across dark space toward that cursed planet. But he didn't think, at least, he hoped that he had not been out long. He wasn't strong enough to brute force his way out of the ropes binding him, but Detyans had never been built to rely on pure strength alone. He flexed his hands until his claws shut out from his knuckles. They weren't very long, extending only a few inches out wickedly curved, and sharp enough to disembowel a Leru ox if given the chance. Rue strained, trying to find a way to swipe at the fibers rubbing his skin raw. After several uncomfortable moments, and one cramp that left him cursing silently, he was able to reach up and saw at the rope. It wasn't quick work. The fibers were thick and coarse, and he had very little leverage to get the job done. But after several painful minutes, his shoulders sagged as the final strands gave way, loosening the bindings on his wrists and freeing him from his place on the wall. His freedom was limited by the bars in front of him. The cell was fairly large, and judging by the faint scent of flour in the air, he would wager that, under normal circumstances, it was used to hold excess supplies rather than prisoners. All the better for him. They might have missed something in trying to make it ready to hold him. So many everyday supplies could be used offensively, he only needed one. Beyond the cell there was a small room with a desk and chair jutted off to one side. A heavy gray door stood closed less than two meters away, tantalizingly close, but completely out of reach. Rue tested the bars, happy to find they weren't electrified. He could deal with the pain, but every small obstacle made getting back to Liss that much harder. And there was no way they were going to keep him away from his Denya, not now that he'd found her. Now that he'd claimed her. Footsteps pounded beyond the door and slowed as they approached. Rue heard the creaking groan of heavy metal moving and jumped back to where he'd been tied, holding his hands in place so it looked like the rope still bound him. There was no use in giving up what little freedom he had if he could avoid it. At first, he could barely make out the green skin of the short Poland who walked in and closed the door behind himself. 
but then his captor flung off at the dark cloak he wore and hung it on a hook on the door. He wore dark combat gear and carried a stunner stick in a sheath on his belt. Those beauties could incapacitate a 500 kilo Yorgluff with one blow, but they were close contact weapons, more powerful than some blasters, but few liked to give up the range offered by projectile weapons. That meant that this Poland knew how to fight, and he wasn't afraid to get close. And that was just what Rue needed. The Poland looked him over, first examining the ropes wrapped around his hands, and then taking stock of the rest of him. Rue tried to look as pathetic and dazed as he could. Anger simmered, but he kept it contained. Not right now. Not yet, he told himself. He needed to wait until the moment was right. The guard pulled out his stunner stick, but he didn't engage the power. Instead, he walked up close to the cell and started to run the staff against the metal bars, taunting Rue. But he wasn't close enough. Rue doubted he'd be able to reach him before the stick powered up and took him down. So he watched with heavy-lidded eyes, a sneer glued to his lips. The Poland trilled something at him in indecipherable Poland. I don't speak green asshole. Rue replied in IC. The Poland hissed and surged forward as if he understood the insult. Rue took his chance. He sprang up from where he sat, and with one hand grabbed for the stunner, the other swiped for the Poland's throat, claws still extended and beyond deadly. Sulfurous orange blood pulsed out as Rue's claws hit home. He stepped back as the Poland fell, one hand clasped to his throat, and a desperate, clinging look in his huge eyes. Maybe Rue should have felt some level of remorse for taking a life. It was an action that should never be taken lightly, but all he felt was the beating sense of determination to get out and get home. The Poland fell close enough for Rue to reach out and grab the keycard to unlock the cell door. One swipe later, and the door swung open to allow him freedom. Rue stepped around to where the Poland fell to get to the door. His hand was on the knob when he saw the cloak hanging right in front of him. He pulled it on and pulled up the hood to cover his distinctly non-Poland features. He pocketed the keycard that had let him out of his cell, hoping it would offer access to anywhere else he needed to go. If the dead Poland had high enough clearance to open a prisoner cell, it stood to reason that he'd be able to get into other restricted areas of the ship, areas that would let Rue escape. He just needed to get to an emergency life pod. All ships had them in some form or another. They were small vessels that could carry between one and ten people, depending on the size of the ship. The big cruisers carried actual escape pods that could hold dozens or hundreds, and once he found the life pod, he'd be on his way to freedom. They couldn't have made it far from Honora Station. He refused to believe it. He also grabbed the stunner stick from where it had fallen out of the dead Poland's grasp. There was no use going into hostile territory unarmed. He opened the door and faced the white, bright hallway. The lights lined across the ceiling might as well have been suns. Compared to the cell, it made Rue's eyes ache. But after a few moments, they adjusted, and he was on his way, shoulders slumped down to try and affect a more pole in height. It wouldn't fool anyone up close, so he couldn't get close. The hallway was deserted. Rue went right on instinct and followed several bright corridors in what felt like an outward direction. Truth was, he had no way of knowing if he was headed in the right direction. All the signs along the white walls were written in Poland script, and he couldn't hope to decipher it. He was about to turn down another hall when the zing of a blaster shot cut him off, almost hitting him in the shoulder. He threw himself back and crouched down, trying to stay out of the eyeline of his attacker. But the shots flew past him and down the hallway where he'd planned to turn. A firefight on the ship? That would explain the sirens. Rue powered up the stunner, ready for anyone to run his way. He looked back down the hallway that he'd come from, but something rode him hard, telling him to stay in place. If he went back now, there was no telling what trouble he'd run into. And so he waited, biding his time. After several minutes, the blaster shots stopped. With a final blast, the shots down on one end of the hall ended, finishing off the last of whoever they were shooting at. Rue hoped they were the ship's attackers. Anyone attacking the Polans right now was a friend of his, even pirates. Footsteps started toward him, and he could hear the quiet murmur of voices, speaking something that wasn't Poland, but he was too far away to make out the words. As they got closer, he gripped his stunner tighter, ready to lash out if potential friend turned to foe. Then the steps were right next to the junction in the hallway. 
he raised up his stunner, ready to strike. And then Lys appeared, stunner drawn. They stood frozen for a moment before a smile broke out on her face and she lowered the weapon. She surged forward, heedless of his weapon, and wrapped her arms around him tightly. I knew you were here. I could feel it. He switched off the power of the stunner and grasped her with his free arm. How did you find me? He wanted to push her up against the wall and kiss her senseless and then yell at her for putting herself in danger. Save the celebration for when you've earned it. Another familiar voice spoke. Rue looked up to see Loam come into view. Rue opened his mouth to say something, but Loam slapped a teleport tracker against his chest before the words came out. He pressed the giant blue button, and Rue's ears popped for a moment before everything went black. It lasted only a second, and then he was back on Honora Station, standing in a transporter pod and looking at a woman with purple skin and bright blue eyes. Oh, Scavian, if he had to guess. Step out of the pond, please, she told him. Rue moved, knowing that they could only transport Loam and list back once he was safe. His heart beat raggedly as the seconds ticked by. Every moment that they were left in danger because of him was a moment that he couldn't breathe. The transporter engaged again, and this time it was Liz that appeared in the pod. She clutched her hand to the side, and he could see the red stain of blood beginning to spread, but she stepped out of the pod without being told, barely limping. It was only when she made it to him that she sagged, the strength leaving her. Rue tugged her close, pressing his hand over her own, trying to staunch the flow of blood. No, he commanded. You don't get to leave me. Not now. Not after we've just found each other. She sucked in a ragged breath. Just a flesh. She licked her lips before finishing. Wound. You need a medic, he said, watching the color drain from her. Distantly, he heard the transporter engage again. Loam stepped out and took one look at Lys and Rue before letting out an expert strain of expletives. You stupid human, why didn't you say you were wounded? Loam demanded as he knelt beside them. He gestured something to the Oscavian woman, but Rue couldn't look away from Lys to see what he wanted. Hey, Lys said, this time her voice growing stronger. She tilted her head toward Loam. You don't get to yell at me, only he gets... Her voice trailed off before she finished the sentence. Then her head lolled back as the fight went out of her, and she gave herself over to unconsciousness. Liz! Rue shook her, trying to wake her up, but it did no good. She was completely out. Chapter 20 Her mouth tasted like cardboard and thorns had started to grow out of her side as Liz began to feel again. Everything was dark around her, but after a moment, she realized that it was only because her eyes were closed. Opening them up took too much effort, so she let her head settle back against her pillow as she tried to remember why it felt like she'd been dragged behind a racing speeder. It came in flashes. Rue, the Poland ship, an unlucky blaster shot just before she teleported, the transporter, then black. She felt something pulling on her arm and trying to jerk away, but it was like she was moving through syrup. Liz forced her eyes open, and then turned her head to spy an IV stuck in her arm, brightly colored fluids being delivered directly into her bloodstream. Rue? She tried to call out for him, but it came out like a sad sound between a gasp and a whisper. She licked her lips and tried again, voice gaining strength. Rue? A look around the small room told her he wasn't there. It didn't look like any hospital room that she'd ever seen on Earth, though she couldn't actually remember the last time she'd been to a functioning hospital. The room was small, and she lay on a cot-like bed pushed against one wall with a little space on either side for doctors to stand. Her vitals pulsed on one wall, undecipherable to her uneducated eye. An empty chair sat flush up against the bed. It looked well used and horribly uncomfortable, the thin layer of padding having flattened completely after what appeared to be years of use. The door opened quietly, and then a familiar alien, her alien, stepped into the room. Their eyes met, and she tried to smile, but whatever drugs she'd been given made the movement difficult. Rue shut the door behind him and took a seat beside her, placing one hand on top of hers. Good morning, he said softly. Lys squeezed his fingers. 
How long was I out? She was beginning to wake up more, gaining her voice back. A few hours. From the tousled look of his hair and the bags under his eyes, she would have thought it had been days. But with the stress of his capture on top of her injury, he had to be nearing collapse. You need to rest, she told him, reaching over to stroke his cheek. He leaned close until she could touch him. You should talk. Sleep. Nah, I'm tough. No stupid blaster shot can keep me down. But she would have greatly appreciated some regen gel at the moment. Regular treatment sucked compared to it. The fact that it hadn't been used told her that her injury was worse than either she or Rue were admitting. Surgeons only operated in dire cases. That wasn't a blaster, he said, the fire in his eyes bright with emotion. It was a last shooter. Liss's eyebrows shot up. Last shooters were serious weapons. That she was awake after a few hours told her the blow had been glancing. Last fire got into a victim's veins and ate them from the inside out if it wasn't caught quickly enough. Are you all right? She asked, afraid to think of what that shot might have done to her. Is Loam? What about Sun? He placed a finger on her lips. As far as slapdash rescue missions go, it couldn't have gone better. We're all safe. I was just talking to Loam's friend in station security. They've detained the Polans and will issue a hefty fine before banning the entire crew from the station. Polai will deny all involvement, but what else would you expect? Anger simmered under his words, but he spoke gently. Are they going to come after us again? Because they couldn't have Rue. Last fire or no, he was hers, and she was keeping him forever. He laced his fingers through hers and leaned forward to kiss her hand. I can't say. I wouldn't be too shocked if I've got a bounty out on me. They can't take you, she vowed. You're mine. He grinned, and the stress of the day disappeared. I wouldn't dare disappoint you. So, how long are they going to keep me tied to this bed? She wanted out, wanted to take Rue back to their rooms, and show him that they both survived and make love to him until day and night lost their meaning. The doc said tomorrow, they've got some fancy thing in your IV healing you. He leaned back in the chair, but didn't let go of her hand. Liz's heart clenched. You look exhausted. You should go sleep. Rue shook his head. I don't think I could fall asleep away from you. Not after today. The naked honesty shook her to her core. She realized that when Rue said he wasn't holding anything back, he meant it. There would be no secrets between them. Nothing but complete honesty. She scooted to the side, opening up a narrow gap in the mattress. Keep me warm? She asked. He didn't need to be told twice. But Rue positioned himself carefully. He avoided her wound in her IV, draping his arm over her shoulders and pulling her close. The clean scent of his skin told her he'd showered, but underneath he smelled like Rue, like home. I love you, she said. And despite what she feared, it wasn't hard at all to let the words out. I'm so glad you found me on that shitty planet. I love you too. Rue kissed the top of her head. And thank you. She tilted her head up. For what? The look he gave her said it all. His brow was drawn down in disbelief. You were just nearly killed by the Polans for saving my life. But he let out a small, relieved laugh when he said it, and she knew that despite his yelling, he wasn't mad at her. Liz traced her hand up and down the fabric of her shirt. I think this relationship needs some rules. He quirked up a brow. Oh, yeah? She nodded. Number one, no more kidnapping or getting kidnapped. They'd more than filled their quota on that mark. Rue tapped a finger against her nose. Number two, lots of sex. Oh, yeah, she said, nodding. Lots. And then Rue was kissing her, and for a few moments, Liz was able to forget about the pain in her side until she tried to turn further toward him, and she pulled on something. With a gasp of pain, she pulled back. Lots of sex later, when I can move. Rue looked worried, but when she settled in beside him, he seemed to realize that she was okay, just tender. The others, those humans that helped, wanted to see you. I told them to wait until you're better. Good, I need to thank them, she sighed. Loam too. Without him, we wouldn't have made it. They can all wait, he said, protective possessiveness in his words. 
So, what's next? She wasn't going to be injured forever, and they had their whole lives ahead of them. How would you like to meet my family? He asked it like he expected her to say no. But Lys wasn't about to do that. Hell yes! I want to meet your family, and I want to go back to Earth. He looked startled, and she realized how it sounded. I'm not saying we need to go live there or anything, but I had friends, sort of. I want to see them again, and to show them I'm okay. And, she added with deliberate nonchalance, maybe to show you off. His chest puffed up. Show me off? Are you saying I'm someone your friends would find worthy? Lys laughed and snuggled in closer to the now familiar scent of her denya. It's not every day a poor earth girl like me finds a sexy alien mate. They're all going to be so jealous. This has been Ruin, Mated to the Alien, written by Kate Rudolph and Star Huntress, narrated by Zachary Michael, copyright 2016 by Kate Rudolph, production copyright 2017 by Kate Rudolph.